So let's get started. So I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. Uh, we're a center right think tank that generally promotes uh, free market outcomes and uh, the governance program specifically deals with questions about uh, why Congress functions the way it does, how to make it function better, uh, maybe how to have a little bit better oversight of the executive branch and a whole host of other things. Um, I think we have a pretty interesting panel today and uh, a very interesting topic, a kind of a, a hot button topic, I guess. Uh, you know, what have the obstacles been to uh, the democratic agenda so far in this uh, in this session? So uh, before we get going into that, I just wanna quickly introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Matthew Glassman. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown University. Uh, prior to being at GAI, he worked on the Hill for the Congressional Research Service for 10 years, I think more than 10 years. Um, his portfolio focused on congressional operations, separation of powers, the appropriations process, agency design, and congressional history. Uh, and prior to that, he worked for the House Appropriations Committee uh, and specifically as professional staff uh, on the legislative branch subcommittee. Uh, Matt has taught courses on and off the Hill uh, on American government, congressional process, uh, congressional presidential uh, relations, and congressional leadership. And he holds a PhD and uh, two masters from Yale University. Uh, our second panelist is Molly Reynolds, uh, a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings. Uh, she studies Congress with an emphasis on how congressional rules and procedure affect domestic policy outcomes. Uh, she's also the author of the book, Exceptions to the Rule, The Politics of Filibuster Limitations in the U.S. Senate, uh, which explores the creation, use, and consequences of the budget reconciliation process and other procedures that prevent filibusters in the U.S. Uh, her current research includes work on oversight in the House, uh, congressional reform and the congressional budget process. Uh, she also supervises the maintenance of the vital statistics on Congress. Brookings is a very long running resource uh, on, on the first branch of government. Uh, Molly holds her PhD in political science and public policy from the University of Michigan uh, and uh, previously served as a senior research coordinator in governance studies at Brookings uh, and has also served as an instructor at George Mason. Uh, and finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, is my, my colleague, James Walner, a senior fellow and polymath, I guess, at the R Street Institute, uh, who writes on theory and practice of democratic politics, um, separation of powers, Congress, political parties, and the federal policy proce uh, process. Uh, James is also a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Clemson University. Uh, prior to being in R Street, James was group vice president for research at the Heritage Foundation spent over a decade on Capitol Hill earlier in his career, working in senior positions in both the House and the Senate. Uh, he was executive director of the Senate Steering Committee during the chairmanships of Pat Toomey and Mike Lee. Um, and prior to that was uh, legislative director to Jeff Sessions and, and Pat Toomey, uh, beginning his career in the House uh, uh, as a legislative assistant. James, the author of multiple books, uh, numerous articles on the American founding, uh, separation of powers, Congress, uh, parliamentary procedure, and budget process. Uh, and he has a doctorate and master's from the Catholic University of America, as well as a master's um, uh, from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. So uh, let's kind of jump right into it. We, uh, we are in a very interesting time right now, I think. Uh, you know, it's pretty rare to have so many events, I think, coming up. I and mean, we have multiple reconciliation packages. We had the infrastructure bill. Uh, we have, you know, the issue of funding the government. We have um, the debt limit debate. So I'm, I'm probably forgetting something else. The NDAA, I guess, as we were talking about before we started. So um, maybe, Molly, I'll start with you. If you want to just kind of give us a little bit of the lay of the land here um, in terms of, you know, what are all of these issues? What are the deadlines? And uh, what's kind of, you know, what's the lead up into where we are now? And what do we have to look forward to maybe in the next couple of months? So much to look forward to. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for um, having uh, me here today um, with uh, with Matt and James. So you really hit kind of the the highlights, um, and I will maybe take them up in expected order of um, uh, res next action. I don't want to say resolution because there's a lot of uncertainty about how long it'll take to ultimately um, resolve them. So. Um, the um, we have the reconciliation package, um, colloquially referred to as the Build Back Better bill. Um, there was folks may have seen um, a like human representation in Schoolhouse Rock style um, roaming around yesterday. Um, that uh, that is um, uh, moving 
uh, through the House um, uh, as we speak with uh, potentially, I think, a vote either today or tomorrow, um, depending on when um, the Congressional Budget Office finish, finishes releasing its scores of the various titles. Um, we have, um, in addition to that, the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which is um, moving through the Senate um, uh, as, uh, as we speak. Um, that is the major defense policy bill for the year, but it is increasingly also seen as a kind of vehicle to which other issues get attached because um, folks consider it to be a must pass, um, a must pass bill that leaves the station every year at the end of the year. And um, we've seen one of the principal uh, or sort of one high profile question of whether an issue gets linked to the NDAA with this discussion over whether that's um, how the um, how Congress is ultimately going to pass um, the um, USICA, the, um, the competition package that um, was worked on earlier in the year. So um, after that, we have um, a, a measure, we'll need a measure to keep the government funded uh, past early December. There are a number of different ideas floating out there for what that might look like, whether it's another continuing resolution for um, a short period of time, for a longer period of time, so I'm taking us into um, sometime into 2020, calendar 2022. Um, and then um, we also will at some point need uh, another measure to um, address the, the debt limit um, and what exactly that would look like. Um, our colleagues at the Bipartisan Policy Center are out with their kind of regular update on um, when that would need to happen by. Um, and right now, I believe it's sometime between mid-December and early uh, February. So there's a lot, um, in, in part because of, um, as, um, as Jonathan um, knows and has written about, um, one, of the, uh, one of the sources on, of uncertainty about the debt limit is the infrastructure, involves the infrastructure package that was, um, that was just passed and what it means for, um, for our levels of um, debt in the, very, in the very short term. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. Um, uh, and those four pieces are all both distinct from each other and also related to each other politically and potentially procedurally. Um, we can talk um, more about what that might look like, um, especially around kind of the debt limit and reconciliation if folks are interested. But that's kind of how I see the lay of the land um, in the coming weeks. Yeah, th thanks, Molly. Um, Matt, I want to direct my next question to you, which is kind of, in essence, I mean, who or, or what is to, to blame for this mess, or is, or is no one to blame? You know, I think that um, in my experience, there's this a little bit of tension, I think, or, or sort of competing explanations that typically exist for dysfunction in Washington. You know, the on the one hand, I think that, you know, the, the lay observers of politics tend to sort of want to blame people or say that this is all responsible, but, you know, certain individuals are responsible for, um, for you know, the dysfunction that we see. And I think there's this competing uh, explanation, which is, you know, that it's it's being driven instead by sort of institutional problems, and that the our institutions are maybe broken or not functioning in the way that they're supposed to. And this tends to, I think, be a little bit of the the favored perspective of political scientists. And so, um, you know, does that tension? Do you think there's a tension there? And I guess the the, the question is is sort of, you know, um, do you think that these obstacles are, uh, what, what are the real obstacles and the things that are causing the, the, the dysfunction that we see currently? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I would start by just sort of trying to reframe this idea of dysfunction. I, a lot of people are frustrated right now with Congress, but a lot of that is just frustration with like how a legislature works. Um, and, and you see this framing in the media all the time that because people in Congress are arguing about something, that something's broken. But like, this is a legislature. This is how a republic works, right? You get a bunch of people together who don't agree on something and they scream at each other for a while. And hopefully that produces something. But if you're trying to take the screaming out of it, or you're trying to take the time it takes out of it, or you're trying to take the sort of give and take and compromise out of it, you don't really like legislative politics, right? You just want outcomes that you prefer. Um, and that's not what politics is about in a republic. Uh, so part of me is very hesitant to endorse this idea that things are broken just because the Build Back Better bill is taking a long time to pass and may not pass, right? Like plenty of times a legislature considers things, they go through the motions and they fight about it and then nothing happens. And like, that's an okay outcome. Um, and I don't think of that uh, as dysfunctional. That said, I do think that 
the institutional structures right now are set up in some ways not to sort of optimize how a legislature should work, even if you accept that people are wrong about sort of like legislative politics, they're always going to hate that. But how we are currently set up, I do think, is very unstable. Um, and, and the core problem to me is that sort of the existence of the 60 vote Senate, which has largely been in place only for about a decade now, really since 2010 or so, um, is forcing sort of majorities to either contemplate blowing up sort of the Senate rules in total or shift towards the strategy of massive omnibus bills in must pass legislation or reconciliation bills. As Mahler was pointing out, really the things that ride now in the, in, in the Senate or through Congress are the NDAA, the Appropriations Acts maybe, and the reconciliation bills. Uh, and when all your policy has to get pushed into those things, it changes sort of the nature of the debate. Um, I would be much happier if we were debating early childhood education and parental leave and climate bills and tax policy and separate legislation uh, on its own to say nothing of like 12 different appropriations bills. Uh, but the nature of uh, the political structure right now doesn't make that possible. And I think that sort of exacerbates things. Um, other institutional hurdles right now are sort of more local to this Congress. Um, intense competition for both chambers and very thin margins make everything seem a lot more sort of on the, on the breaking point than it is. And the last thing I would say is that I think people forget this Congress is a Congress in crisis. Um, and it's easy to sort of like forget this, but this Congress started with two major crises, one ongoing with the pandemic, which is still shaping the rules and procedures in Congress. We have proxy voting, the public isn't allowed in, people are forced to wear masks on the floor. This is not a normal legislature. And the second, of course, was the insurrection. You know, people forget this Congress, we had an insurrection of the Capitol and an impeachment trial of the President of the United States, right? When we look back on this Congress in 100 years, the Build Back Better Act probably won't be what people will remember from the 117th Congress. It'll be what happened in January. Uh, and that has created an atmosphere, I think, probably a low point of trust uh, within the legislature, both you know, between the parties and just generally speaking. I, I think and that creates a difficult atmosphere for legislation. And I will, I will stop talking because I, I want to hear what other people think about this, too. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's a great point. I think you're, you're, um, you're turning the conventional wisdom on its head. So maybe, James, I'll bring you into the conversation. So does this mean that we shouldn't care about Joe Manchin or, or Kirsten Sanders, that they don't really uh, they don't really matter? Or what's your sort of take? Are, I mean, the, the popular dialogue, certainly recently, at least from from, you know, maybe the, the sort of center left uh, media has been that that, you know, they're, they are responsible for sort of gumming up the legislative um, the legislative body and that the, the Biden administration has not really been able to get their priorities through Congress because of their sort of obstructionism or or, you know, if you want to be even broader, the obstructionism of, of, of the minority party as well. And so, you know, should we care about them? To what degree should we care about them? Well, first, I want to thank, uh, you know, you for hosting this event, moderating it, and our viewers for tuning in. I want to thank Matt and Molly. I always uh, try to appear on panels with people like Matt and Molly, who are, you know, extraordinarily intelligent, who I have nothing but respect for in their work. And I've learned a lot from them over the years. It, I try to like, you know, look better by osmosis or just by like association. Maybe I can pick up some things here or there. And so it's always great to see you guys even during the, uh, the, these very weird and uh, surreal times. I think a lot of the points are, are absolutely spot on. I mean, what Matt's saying is essentially Congress isn't a factory. It's not a factory. We're not assembling blueprints according or assembling products according to some blueprint that somebody somewhere else at some other time designs. That's not what members of Congress do. They're literally designing the blueprint and assembling the product at the same time. But even that, I think, loses sight of what Congress is. Congress is a place where people go to participate in an activity, and that activity is self-government. And out of that arguing, and bargaining and negotiation arises compromise. But you have to have all that other arguing and bargaining stuff first. We've lost sight of that. We think conflict is bad. And we've lost sight of the Congress as a whole. And I think in no other area in our politics right now is the kind of the gap between how we think about a place and how we think about an institution and the reality of that institution on the ground and how it operates in practice. In no other area is it greater than in Congress. Because it's just flat out, look, the filibuster is not the problem. They don't have the votes. We talk about Manchin. Right now, there's a 50-50 split in the Senate. You have the vice president who votes, uh, presumably, to break a tie uh, under the Constitution with the Democrats. So that gives them, uh, you know, majority control. But if you don't have 51 votes, if you don't have a simple majority, then you can't do anything. I mean, it's in the Constitution. What are you going to do? 
And so I'm not sure why the filibuster is the problem. And there are ways of dealing with members who are trying to hold out. You can structure the world to make it feel like they're, you know, make them feel pressured that they have to go along with you. That's what happened with Pelosi and House progressives, I think, and, and delinking the infrastructure bill. I think it's a great example of how leaders can maneuver and position uh, their outliers or their moderate members and put them into a position where they basically have to either follow through on their bluffs or they have to actually not follow through on their bluffs. And right now they're just meeting behind closed doors and Manchin says, you know what, I'm not gonna do X, Y, and Z. Well, they have no way of knowing if he's actually serious because the filibuster is not a veto. All the filibuster is, is the ability to stand up and talk. And while yes, it is the Senate and yes, people in the Senate, myself included, can talk for a very long period of time about seemingly nothing. It is something you can't talk forever. It's human. It's just the reality. We have physical limitations. And then you factor in a whole bunch of other stuff. You can't talk forever. I'm not seeing any filibusters. I'm not seeing any filibusters. I'm seeing a lot of people unable to come to an agreement behind closed doors. But the rules of the process, the cameras, the constituents, the other members, all these things come together to drive members towards agreement. And when I worked in the Senate, I would try to stop bills for, my, uh, for the members I worked for. And the first thing I would do every single time is just stop the process. Then you figure out what you do next. And if you stop the process, you might have a chance at defeating a bill. Well, right now, our leaders are, st are starting the process by stopping it. I mean, it's the dumbest thing if you think about it in terms of how you go about passing legislation. If you start just driving through and offering amendments, voting them down, voting them up, all this other stuff, guess what? A bill is going to pass in the end. It almost always does. And the simple fact of their unwillingness to do so because they don't want to have messy uh, party dividing votes on either side. Uh, they don't like the uncertainty. They don't like the scheduling nightmares. They don't like all this other stuff. But that other stuff is like part and parcel of what it means to be a legislator. And unless you're willing to do that, especially in places like the Senate, you're not going to be able to legislate. And right now, the Republicans couldn't legislate. The Democrats can't legislate. I don't see this changing anytime soon until how we manage and think about the institution changes as well. So I want to um, come back yeah. to something that Matt was talking about um, in terms of um, the reconciliation process, which for better or worse, I have spent too much of my life thinking about. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges that um, uh, Democrats are facing right now is that that is a set of rules and procedures that um, gets you a lot. It, it does get you the opportunity to legislate without the threat of a filibuster, but the costs that come with trying to move a, po a policy agenda through that process are non-trivial. And it's not a process that the rules um, were not designed to do the kind of legislating that Democrats are currently trying to do through the process. Um, and I say that largely because um, they have, um, so, Back in the 80s, um, one of the things that was attractive about the reconciliation process um, in, the, in being used to try and achieve deficit reduction is that you would write a set of reconciliation instructions. So you would say to lots of committees in the House and lots of committees in the Senate, you all have to go out there and try to figure out how to make some cuts in the programs that are in your jurisdiction to achieve overall deficit reduction. We're really spreading the pain around. Everyone has, we're trying to get everyone to buy into this shared goal of deficit reduction. Now um, they're trying to write a bill that is not deficit reducing, but deficit increasing um, by and large, that it increases spending on, um, on, uh, uh, in the jurisdictions of, um, of most committees, while also having to abide by all of the other complicated rules of the process. And like those two things are really, I think, coming into to conflict. Um, and one, I'm going to sort of disagree a little bit with James about the idea that the, the filibuster isn't what's driving this, because I think what is driving this is the idea that if we can't move anything else because of the threat of a filibuster, everything has to go through, we have to thread this needle. Everything as, that we possibly can has to go all in one bill, all together. And so when uh, Matt was saying before that in a more functional Congress, we would see 
the Senate debating um, early spending on early childhood and the Senate debating whether to add a dental benefit to Medicare and the Senate debating um, the clean energy tax credits or whatever um, those the climate related provisions of the of the bill are separately. Um, that simply no one sees that as a realistic option because um, the, the filibuster is is really shaping this whole debate. And let me just jump in real quick. I think it's a very valid point, though. I mean, the threat of a filibuster is the threat of one person standing up and saying, I'm going to talk forever how long I can talk. And if the majority calls you bluff, you quickly realize you don't have a lot of leverage with the filibuster. If you have 50 people, maybe, but it very rarely are the Republicans going to be all in opposition to something that Democrats are going to do. I do want to take issue, though, with this notion of the reconciliation rules. Right now, we have a situation with immigration on the reconciliation bill, and they want to put this policy, which clearly at least isn't, doesn't appear to be budgetary in nature, um, in a reconciliation bill, which is a special fast track budget process. And the Senate has rules to protect the filibuster to prevent senators from doing an end run around it by using this process. They tried earlier in the year to do something with minimum wage. These are two Democratic priorities, ostensibly. You know, from the paper, they don't look like they're budgetary, but from the rules perspective, the only thing that matters, Senate rules are either Senate rules or their precedents, or, you know, I don't want to bore you with the other details. And there are no precedents on this question. And Democrats are blaming a, a staffer, a parliamentarian. It's unadjudicated. I, if I was a senator, I'd probably vote and say this, there should be a precedent that this immigration provision ought not to be included in a reconciliation bill. But until the Senate creates that precedent, it doesn't exist. And under Article uh, 1, Section 5, Clause 2, the parliamentarian and no one else other than senators, they can't make the rules. Only senators can. But now we have senators, Democrats and Republicans did it before, who say we all agree on X. We all agree on the minimum wage. We all agree on immigration. But then they blame the rules for why they're not acting. And they blame the filibuster for why they have to live under those rules, when in reality, they could easily easily try to do it. They could easily, with Harris in the chair, defeat a point of order against this. They could create a new precedent. And last time I checked, the senators don't really care about the rules anyway. They nuke them left and right whenever they get in their way. I think the problem is we have two divided parties internally who don't agree on anything. And that ostensibly isn't a problem. After all, the Senate of the 60s and 70s was one of the most legislatively productive Senates we ever had, and the parties were divided. But you have to have lots of votes and you have to have lots of debates and you have to reveal those divisions. And right now we have two parties that don't want to do that. So they are hiding behind things like the bird rule and the reconciliation process. They hide behind the threat of a filibuster. How long can Roger Wicker speak on the Senate floor? And then if his family wants him home because they got to go to dinner on Saturday night, then how long can he speak? And then how long can somebody else speak? And then how long can you speak when you know the second you sit down, they're going to have a vote and you're going to lose? It's remarkable how not powerful the filibuster is when you have a majority that's willing to call your bluff on it. So I want to say some, I want to say a couple things here and then I'll let Matt come back in. So one is that um, I, um, I am in agreement that sort of the rules aren't magic. Like they can't force agreement where agreement doesn't exist. Um, and if there aren't 50 votes for something, there aren't 50 votes for something. I do think it's worth asking, um, and I don't have all the answers to this, but sort of I think there are reasons beyond simply, um, I, think, I think it's not just that senators are sort of hiding behind the rules or hiding behind the parliamentarian. I think there's a real question about sort of why in this example, the parliamentarian kind of persists as an institution that senators listen to um, in the Senate. And I think it has a lot to do with um, kind of wanting to maintain some kind of stable equilibrium. And so the example that I always, um, that I often use is like, if you start overruling the parliamentarian on questions, or so, <clears throat> I should say, if you start disregarding the advice of the parliamentarian on questions about the uh, what's permissible under the bird rule or um, things like that, or you, um, as some have called to fire the parliamentarian um, for giving you advice that you um, that you don't like. Um, that has sort of far reaching ripple effects on sort of the functioning of the entire chamber. Like, do you do you want someone firing the parliamentarian every time there's a disagreement about which committee a bill gets referred to since the parliamentarian is also the person who gives advice on committee jurisdictions like there's a there are reasons why the institution persists as a stable equilibrium um, in the senate that are beyond simply just the current set of democratic senators have things that they don't agree on and that they are trying to hide behind those rules and 
her advice um, to cover up for the fact that they don't agree on them. Matt, I want to. I, I mean, I, uh, I think that's true. I, I, I think there's something sticky about both the Senate and House rules that is unexplainable in reference to sort of like current preferences. And in the, in the House, you see it with like the continued existence of the motion to recommit, right? Like, why would a majority ever allow that to exist? Um, and, and with the Senate parliamentarian, the same thing. I think a lot of senators, probably whether they're doing it explicitly or implicitly, are very worried about people who would like to transform these institutions into something besides sort of like functioning legislatures. I mean, you see this impulse all around town that we should just kill the filibuster and get the leaders to get everybody in line and let the president sort of lead a legislative agenda like we're some sort of European parliament. And, and I don't know if senators have that consciously on their head, but as you sort of remove veto players from the Senate and House and streamline the process and reduce the power of the committees and reduce sort of floor action of backbenchers, that's essentially what you're doing. Um, and you know the sort of all encompassing nature of the presidency uh, and the unquestioned sort of party leadership of the presidency points you towards that sort of Wilsonian type government that I think people in the legislature would be good to sort of push back against and make sure it doesn't happen. Um, I, I did want to sort of look at sort of like the broader view of this, what James is talking about, sort of the internal disputes in the party, because I think, you know, the most fascinating thing that happened to me that I, I saw in the last couple of weeks was sort of the threat by Republicans to punish individual members for, for voting for, for the BIF in the House. Uh, and to me, that was the most sort of emblematic of the sea change in Congress. As much as parties would have liked to punish members in the past for these sorts of votes, it was always believed you just couldn't do it, right? Going back to Roosevelt's purge in 38, it just falls on its face because members are always going to be sort of more popular than your party in their district, and they're just going to be able to beat you. And it's not clear that's the case anymore. Um, and if there's a huge change in Congress, it seems to me that one to be, that members are sort of scared of their own parties in their districts. Uh, and the consequences of that are far reaching. Uh, but one is that sort of the more liberal members of the Democratic Party and the more conservative members of the Republican Party have this sort of vice grip squeeze over sort of the uh, swing seat members that sort of these seats go back and forth in the middle between the parties. And those people are under intense pressure. And it's mostly sort of the pressure of tribal partisanship, not the pressure of policy, um, because the policies are probably good for their districts. Uh, but they're under this intense heat. Um, from the it, and it, yeah. it drives it drives an even more pernicious version of the sort of vote no hope yes dynamic that we saw um uh that we've seen over the the past decade and i think oh the thing that comes to mind is there's a, a member i believe from alabama though i'm i don't don't quote me on that um who uh uh sort of got <laughs> criticized on twitter for tweeting about how the the BIF had some major legislative priority that he had been championing since he came to Congress, despite the fact that he voted against it. And so the um, the degree to which it sort of drives this, um, you want things that are good for your district, but you're scared to vote for them because you're scared of your party, um, your party at home, um, that, do that does nothing good for the legislative process. Well, and let's talk about that that dynamic or the difference between the House and the Senate, maybe with respect to the infrastructure bill. So, you know, I think it was we had 13 Republicans, right, who, who voted for the, for the BIF in the House. Mm -hmm. We had 19, including Senator McConnell, who did in the Senate. So, you know, is the story there just the, the simple, you know, senators have broader constituencies, they have to go and, and take into account maybe a, a little bit uh uh, you know, broader uh, interests on the, on the part of the voters, whereas if you're representing some sort of very conservative or very liberal district, you, you don't really have to think about these bigger concerns, or is there something, is there something else at play there in that, in that particular example? And I'll, well, anyone who I wants mean, I mean the, the first thing is, as it should be, I mean, Congress is a representational body, it's also a lawmaking body. And the idea that the people, I mean, look, if the people are, you know, throwing a, you know, being a skunk at a garden party here, well, then, you know, it is what it is. I mean, that's like the, the representatives work for the people. I think that's the first thing. You know, I, I think if you ask a rank and file conservative or progressive lawmaker or staffer in the Congress about, you know, about having a vice like like grip on the on their moderate members, they would probably uh, laugh at you. They'd probably be like, no, I, I don't, you know, I don't get listened to. It's always the moderates that win. Just look at the infrastructure bill passing. Look at what the progressives have had to see as their reconciliation bill gets pared down. It turns out, and ever since 2010, when conservative Republicans had a little bit of success in primarying um, you know, or incumbents or establishment candidates, 
you know, the, the party's really kind of inoculated itself in many, in, in a lot of respect, maybe not so much about against Trump, but that's a different, a whole different question. Um, you know, the conservatives and the, and the progressives really aren't, it seems to me, in the driver's seat here. You know, they're not. And the out, just look at what's happening in Congress. Look at the outcomes in Congress. You know, conservatives and progressives don't care about votes. They don't care about casting votes. Of course, they don't mind. They don't want to cast votes. Well, we don't see any votes. Why don't we see votes? It's because the moderates, it's because more, you know, establishment type figures um, don't want to cast those votes. They may not want to cast them for lots of reasons that have been discussed. I do think that there's a tension between your kind of policy preferences and your kind of legislative aspirations in terms of being reelected. And members have to balance those tensions. They're going to balance them differently at different times in their career. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it just kind of, it is what it is. But ultimately, the problem with Congress right now is that no one's acting and that they're all not acting the same way, you know, and that's what I find very interesting. The conservatives aren't really doing much of anything right now. The progressives, they tried their best. They, you know, to use some leverage, they ended up getting kind of, in my perspective, they're not going to get a lot. And, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. That's the way it works. But, you know, based on my own experience, it's a lot harder to, to challenge the system from the right or the left in the Senate and in the House than it appears that we think it is on the outside. It, it does strike me that, that James has a point here, which is this, this question of um, there just not being active deliberation anymore. I mean, this is, a, you know, I think a, a trend that we've seen. And Jonathan, let me just interrupt. Sorry, it's not, let's just call it what it is. No one's trying to win on the House and Senate floor. There's no Howard Metzenbaum, there's no Jesse Helms. Nobody's saying this policy is really important to me for policy reasons and I'm gonna force votes on it. No one's saying, I think that this is the future of our country and party and therefore I'm gonna force votes so I can run and I can win in an election and I can get other like-minded members like me here. Nobody seems to be doing anything. It's like there's some secret ghost that's like floating around the Capitol Hill corridors and like spooking everybody. And they're not doing anything and they're just blaming other people. But it turns well, out I agree. That they're not victims. I mean, they're the ones who either act or don't act. And then maybe they shouldn't act, but no one's acting. It doesn't I agree with you to control. a point, although although I do think that there are people who are actively trying to win. I mean, I, I think Speaker Pelosi is doing the things that she's doing because she believes that this process is the best chance that she has to win, right? And I think we saw a similar phenomenon if we look at the way that the, the TCJA was, was you know negotiated in the last Congress, right? I mean, we basically had six people in a room, a couple people from the administration, a couple from the House, and a couple from the Senate, and everyone else was sort of shut out of that process. So I, I think the criticism is um, is very real when we're talking about rank and file members. Hey, I want to touch on Pelosi real quick, and, and, and I'll be quiet here from my colleagues, but I think what she did last week with regard to the progressives and the moderates on the infrastructure bill and kind of delinking it, if you will, from a, from a scaled down re, uh, reconciliation bill, is part and it, it illustrates her skill as a leader. And I say that, look, I'm a, I'm a conservative Republican. I work for conservatives in the Senate. And if you think back to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare debate in 2009, Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid are responsible for that bill passing because after Scott Brown passed, it wasn't clear that they could ultimately get it through. It was a very similar dynamic. And Pelosi was extraordinary in terms of her ability to force that through over the objections of her progressive members in her caucus. And I think we saw something like that again this past week. And we haven't seen that kind of leadership on the Republican side of the aisle in a very long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think one thing that's been rearranged is sort of the aggressiveness of the minority in either party in both chambers to sort of oppose the majority party's program. Um, it's true that the majorities don't appear to be unified. They have huge divisions in their caucus. These are huge tent parties that capture lots of opinion, but the minorities seem to be um, totally unified against sort of the president of the other party and against the majority party's program in many cases where you wouldn't have seen that uh, several decades ago. And the thing that comes to mind is sort of the vote on the, on the ARP, on the recovery plan in, in February, where you have something that by any sort of like public opinion count, you would have to call bipartisan, right? You have huge majorities in favor of this, huge majorities of Republicans in favor of this in the country, and you end up with zero votes from Republicans in the House and Senate. Now, maybe that's good strategy for the Republicans, but it sort of requires us to think of a new definition of sort of bipartisanship, first of all, right? Was that a bipartisan bill? I, not by the traditional definition of who voted for it, but sort of like it was broadly popular throughout the country. Um, but it also, you know, gives you a insight into sort of the new strategy of the minority. And this is sort of a consequence of high party competition, right? Anyone can win the chambers and sort of severe nationalized partisanship. 
And that sort of, I think, in turn has driven the majority strategy, because I agree with James that it's a much more productive legislature in a theoretical sense if we just put stuff on the Senate floor and let people offer amendments and see what product comes out of it, right? And think of it a product, you know, created by 100 people. But when you want to create a product just of your party, right, and the other party will never offer you any help, you're really going to have trouble doing that sort of party deliberation on the floor. Um, and so I, I don't think they're, they're sort of like being irrational to take that party deliberation off the floor. Uh, but I do think it corrodes sort of the traditional, um, both price discovery of the floor, we can find out what, what, what has the votes and what doesn't have the votes, and also sort of the, the nature of the legislature. You hear people all the time say things like, Manchin's got to go because he's holding this bill up. As if Joe Manchin is sort of the only person potentially voting no on this bill. We have 50 people who are definitely voting no on this bill, right? Um, but that's sort of, I think, um, uh, illustrative of how a lot of liberals are thinking about this now. They're not even thinking about this as a Senate of 100 people. They're thinking about this as a party of 50 people. Um, and that sort of gives away the game if you're, if you're, if you're interested in sort of a legislative de deliberation on the floor. And there's a, there, there's a degree to which this has become, I think, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, you, if you, and this was true um, in 2017 with the Republicans and the attempt to repeal the ACA and then with the TCGA, TCJA, and then it's true this year with the ARP and with the Build Back Better bill, which is that when you expect that there's no feasible path forward with votes from the other party and you go the reconciliation route, then you absolve the other party of any need or justification to come to the table. And one of the great ironies, again, of the, the history of the reconciliation process is that if we look back um, into the 80s and 90s, there's a long history of like large bipartisan majorities voting for, particularly in the Senate, voting for reconciliation bills. Like this has not always been, it is always a process that the majority party has tried to steer in a way to accomplish things that are good for it. Um, that you should not go through the trouble of reading my book, but if you did, that is one of the things that you would learn. Um, but it is also the case that like they got large bipartisan majorities to vote for these things um, for, for many years. But now we've reached this point where it's um, seen as like the one neat trick to do what the majority party wants. And then as I was saying earlier, it becomes um, sort of un it, be, it can become unwieldy and it, it um, it's about sort of, um, it's about getting as much as you can in the one shot rather than trying to um, take up things separately and potentially build slightly more fluid coalition. So, you know, to go to uh, Matt's example again from before about early child and like an early universal pre-K program, I don't know what set of senators would vote for that if that came to the floor under a simple majority threshold as a standalone bill. Like I, maybe it would get zero Republican votes. I don't know. But like, we don't know because we don't live in a world where um, that's what folks are willing to do. So one name that, since we're talking about the minority party that hasn't really come up very much in our conversation is Mitch McConnell. Um, so we, we, we talk so much obviously about, about you know, cinema and mansion, but uh, um, we've kind of, forgotten about or maybe a little bit in our conversation here talking about Mitch McConnell. So uh, maybe we can we can delve into that. What is what is Senator McConnell's role exactly in the current Congress and how does he how do you see his actions maybe uh, what, do, what do you see his actions looking like in the sort of upcoming uh, you know issues that we're dealing with? I think McConnell is a great lens to kind of really get a glimpse of the true dysfunction of the body as it exists today. McConnell used to say all the time to his colleagues uh, behind closed doors, he used to say it publicly too. Um, he's like, winners uh, win policy, losers don't. And what he's talking about is that winners who win elections win policy and losers who don't, don't get to make policy. McConnell sees politics through the lens of an election. And it makes sense. If you think Congress is a factory, you need to control the means of production if you want to make your widget. And the way you do that is you win elections, you get votes, you get gavels, you get vice presidents, you get presidents who nominate judges that you can then confirm. Everything becomes about the election. Elections have always been important. I'm not saying that they haven't, but today everything is seen through that lens. And then 
the party leaders have this idea that divided parties can't win elections and take back control of these of, of these chambers or maintain control. And so therefore they try to keep the divisions out of public view, which also, I mean, this has been around since Martin Van Buren and Henry Clay and the Democratic and Whig parties and slavery. This has been around since the first party system in Congress with the Jeffersonian Republicans and the and the Federalist. I mean, parties exist to keep issues on which their members disagree off the agenda. What's different about this, though, is that the members aren't doing anything else. I mean, yeah, they're doing some things like infrastructure, but I mean, give me a break. I mean, the Republican alternative to the stimulus so, bill in 2009, hold on, it, it was, I, but the Republican alternative to the stimulus bill in 2009 was a $500 billion infrastructure bill, and they criticized the $787 billion Democratic infrastructure bill. McConnell was gushing on the floor of the Senate in 2015 after passing an infrastructure bill, a highway bill with Barbara Boxer, literally, I think he was crying at one point. He was so happy. Republicans, that's why he voted for it. Republicans like infrastructure, voters and most rank and file members. And if you put them in a position where they have to choose, do you want to vote for this or not? They're going to oftentimes vote for it. This house is a little different because you can control the agenda a little bit better and it's and you can control how people ultimately get received that kind of vote in the end. But McConnell essentially is... His entire career thus far is in the leader position in the Republican Party has been to shift the decisions and the action away from the floor and into the party luncheons. Harry Reid did that too, but Harry Reid also then turned around and would do things on the floor that ostensibly he shouldn't have been able to do if we take McConnell as our lodestar. McConnell doesn't do anything on the floor, and then he he basically messages and then he goes and wins elections and he says if we don't win this election and if we hey conservatives if you don't hold your you know if you don't actually like be responsible right now the other side's going to win the socialist and then the country's going to fall into the ocean and it turns out that you know whoever's in control the senate kind of looks the same and they're doing kind of the same thing and in 2000 years it's probably going to be indistinguishable and i think that's the joke right now is that it, you have to actually try to do things big things, hard things, whatever, in between elections, in addition to in, in elections. You can't make policy in elections. But I think we have such an electoral focus right now that it has distorted everything else about our system so that we see everything exclusively through that lens. And I think Mitch McConnell is a great example of, of that. I mean, that literally is the personification of, I think, his approach to managing the Senate. I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with that view of McConnell, that McConnell is much more focused on uh, maybe not even winning elections, but maybe maintaining his role as majority leader or getting back his role as majority leader. And that ultimately is an electoral objective for him. I mean, I do think there's this also floating around is this idea you hear about, some people call it like secret Senate, that like there is a lot of stuff that goes on the second burner and passes the Senate in bipartisan ways, right? And you can just line up, I mean, in general, things that happen in the Senate, like either ha don't happen or you get like you put together a good majority for them right like that the CR was obviously like in some places the CR is a failure right but the CR also had disaster relief also had capital security in it had the Afghan resettlement stuff in it right paycheck protection went through on bipartisan right you have the COVID hate crimes act you know, all this NDAA will go through in a bipartisan way US ICA will eventually go through in a bipartisan fashion there is policy to be made uh collectively in Congress um in some ways it becomes about shielding this from voters who don't want you to be bipartisan. I think we have a, a general problem in a lot of the active public, say the chattering class of people paying attention, where anything that's bipartisan, they're all of a sudden skeptical of it. Like if you talk to liberal Democrats, like some of them, like they don't like the biff because 19 Republicans voted from the Senate, so it must be bad or something, right? And that's a really dangerous way to approach sort of legislative politics, where all of a sudden, if things are bipartisan, they're automatically suspect. Yeah, and it's like the it's the flip side of um, the idea that um, so that there's sort of one school of thought that there's some sort of inherent value in bipartisanship that like bipartisanship should be pursued for the sake of bipartisanship, which on one like that's not helpful either. So and then but on as what you're saying that is like also we should not be inherently skeptical of something because it's bipartisan. Um, that the the question is like bipartisan to what end? Um, I mean, I think that uh, what, just one other thing to add, uh, two other things to add, one of McConnell specifically, like one of the, um, the 
other important things to um, remember about McConnell. And I tend to agree with James that he is largely driven by a desire to to win, um, to win elections. Um, but um, sort of a, a, a second ancillary goal is obviously to um, uh, confirm conservative judges, the federal bench. And that is something where now that there is a Democratic president in the off in, in office um, and that there is no filibuster for judicial nominees, that that's a place where the Republicans simply have no influence um, um, in the in the current Senate. And so to the extent that like he has something that he sort of had the Senate focused on for large parts of the Trump administration, um, that's that like that's off the table. The other thing that I, I'll say, and this is what I was going to interrupt James to say before, it's a little bit of a like a pet peeve of mine right now is this idea that like the infrastructure bill was not a big deal. Like it is a large piece of legislation by any um, any standards um, uh, and consequential by any standards that a sort of substance that we would use to apply to it. And it has because it it was linked um, politically and. and various points in different ways procedurally to um, Democrats attempt to move the reconciliation bill, we, I think we got this, there was this kind of sense that like, it was the second fiddle um, to, to the, the other legislation, but it's a, it's a large piece of legislation that will make a difference in the lives of real people and the communities where they live. And I think that um, sort of just thinking about it as like the bipartisan foil to whatever the Democrats more one party agenda is, is the, is a, is not, is the wrong way to think about it. Yeah, and, I'm, and I wasn't suggesting that. I mean, what my point is, when I say don't act, I'm referring to major controversial legislation, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the infrastructure bill, it appears to be kind of party like dividing, but it's not. I mean, these members, if you had a fluid process, they're going to vote for it. the recent history of the exact same members tells us that maybe they won't, but it's the infrastructure bill should pass. It should pass. You don't get any credit for that, Congress. What I'm talking about, and I'm not talking about passage or not passage, I'm talking about are you taking up and adjudicating the concerns of the American people? Because that's, after all, half of the job, and they're not. And that's what, I mean, immigration, maybe the House can do it, but the Senate stays as far away from it as they can because they can't avoid those party dividing votes. Gun control, health care, I mean, just go on down the line. And these are the issues right now that are high on the public's agenda, that are low on Congress's agenda. And this is precisely the dynamic I'm talking about. And the champions of the people are turning around and pretending like they're victims and, and trying to blame other people for why they're not advocating these things. You know, and that's I mean, that's a very different dynamic than the Senate in, say, like the 1960s. And one other thing on the judges, if you, you know, look at the votes on the judges during the Trump administration, the overwhelming vast majority of them were confirmed on large bipartisan majorities. There was unanimous consent on virtually all but two, and those were the two Supreme Court judges, to help facilitate that process to make it go through. The idea, look, maybe they are all conservative judges, but if they are, the Democrats are voting for them too. And if that's the case, then why does it really matter who's in control of the Senate? Maybe it matters who's the president, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter if everybody's voting for these judges. And so McConnell's saying, vote for us so we can vote for somebody else who will then go and do our job for us and rule from the bench, which incidentally is not the most conservative position historically. And everybody's saying, that's the best thing you've ever done. But if you look at the roll call data, Democrats are voting for these judges and not just Manchin, like lots of Democrats. And so maybe they are conservative, but if they are, does that mean the Democrats aren't evil? If you're like a conservative Republican, I, you know, it's just a, yet another contradiction in the kind of reality and the practice of the Senate on the ground and how we talk and think about the Senate from outside the Senate. And those two things don't meet up on most things these days. And, and I think, I don't know why, I don't have all the answers. You, you guys are much more intelligent than I. Hopefully you'll figure this out before I will, but we should at least acknowledge that and then use that to try to start to figure out what those answers might be. I, I do think that, one side problem with the omnibus legislation is that it creates these sort of larger than life fights over sort of very um, uninformative pieces of them, like the size of the omnibus reconciliation bill, right? Like some people say it's 3.5 trillion, but that's really just notional, right? Like there's an amount of spending, there's a nef deficit associated with, it. but even just that fixation on things like top line numbers, set up this battle between people who quote unquote don't want to spend money and people who quote unquote do want to spend money. Uh, whereas you can imagine a world where this is its component pieces and you say, well, like, should we do rural broadband or not? Right. And that's something that, again, crosses party lines and has been sort of a hot topic in Congress and like is in the BIF. Right. Some 
it, Hillary you know, Care is a great, sorry to interrupt Matt, Hillary Care is a great example of that. It was broadly unpopular when it was packaged together as an omnibus piece of legislation. The Senate then spent the rest of the 1990s passing individual provisions of it, oftentimes on large bipartisan majorities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and, and again, they're being forced into this structure, or at least somewhat forced, channeled into this structure where omnibus bills are sort of their advance. But Hillary Clare is one example. The other is like the Compromise 1850. You can stuff mm -hmm. enough into an omnibus bill where everybody hates it. Right. And piece by piece, you can repass something. And, you know, part of the restraint on doing it piece by piece right now is that you cannot do yet 45 different reconciliation bills. Right. And so even if you had 57 votes for 45 different things, you're in a slog then. Right. And so packaging it, I see the sort of impulse to package this stuff, but it really then comes to be defined by sort of these aggregate numbers. I always felt the same way about the Budget Control Act which reduce sort of discretionary spending to sort of like this top line number. And then maybe one number about defense and one number about non-defense. Like no one cares about non-defense spending. Like what are you talking about, right? People care about actual policies underneath that. Uh, but, you know, it just got lost in sort of the, the, the grandness of these packages and, and sort of the high stakes nature of them as well. Right. And it also, I think, shapes the bargaining environment. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't need to, we don't need to go down the road of, the decade we lived under the Budget Control Act. Um, but I think one of the, for me, one of the most profound implications of that for the legislative process was this notion uh, or that sort of members believed that actually like the defense number and the non-defense number were the things to be fought about. Um, and then that, and, and so now that's how they understand the way that the budget process should work is that we should fight about a defense number. We should fight about a non-defense number. If we're gonna raise those from one year to the next, we should be raising them by roughly equivalent amounts. And so it, it um, and I think the same is true about the reconciliation process is that we have this, because of the, the way the procedure is written down on paper, it requires coming to agreement first on a number and then filling in the details of how you get not over that number or not under that number, depending on the nature of your instructions. Um, but the, again, it's, it's a, there are process choices that then drive the way the bargaining and the negotiating happens, which then I think also drives the politics. I think it's I think it's a great point. As someone who who spends a lot of time thinking about budget policy, I think it's exactly accurate and, and, a, and a very good characterization of, of what we saw over the last decade. Doesn't mean it was necessarily a, a bad um, you know the, the budget control act wasn't a good idea, uh, but it does. If you're I mean, if it was designed to reduce spending or at least hold spending according to the caps, it was not a good idea. It clearly didn't work. Right. Uh, that is for maybe a discussion for another for another time. Um, we've got about a little under 10 minutes left. So I do want to think a little bit more um, broadly as we wrap up here. So, you know, we mentioned or the topic came up earlier a little bit about elections and sort of the um, the consequences outside of, of Congress. And so I do want to think a little bit about how some of this governance or congressional dysfunction might relate to these broader electoral questions. I mean, there's been so the news recently, right, has been a lot of the discussion about uh, the Virginia and, and to a lesser extent, the New Jersey gubernatorial elections. Um, I think that there was a uh, assumption maybe among some members of the Democratic Party that they were, um, those elections didn't go quite the way they expected because of the um, the inability or the, the lack of um, urgency to pass first the infrastructure package and now um, BBB. And so I wonder if you if you think that that's accurate, and maybe if we can speak a little bit to um, a related question, which is not just the, the gubernatorial races that just happened, but also the midterms that are that are coming. To what degree, you know, beyond I guess Senator McConnell, are our members sort of being guided by expectations of what they want to happen? Uh, uh, you know, a year from now. So whoever I mean, I, I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues, but just real quick. I mean, I'm always suspicious of like, you know, a New York mayoral election is turning on the, the House's inability to pass an infrastructure bill. Maybe I'm wrong. I would defer no, to people I... who've focused. But, you know, I just want to say the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passes in the in what June, Matt, of a presidential election year, June of a presidential election year. They won't even say the word budget, which is like a non-binding like piece of paper with a bunch of numbers that nobody can read and understand it, like two months before an election year is even set to begin. And I think that is just a great stark reminder of the how the primacy of elections for good or bad 
is has shifted recently and how we think about them and how it's literally stunting, stunting the deliberative process, the lawmaking process, the representational process, the arguing and fighting process, whatever you want to call it inside the House and Senate these days. It's, it's astonishing to me. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm a Virginia voter and I, I talk to other Virginia voters and obviously like I don't have a random sample of Virginia voters, but I think it's basically lunacy to think that the failure to pass something in Congress affected people's vote in the Virginia governor's race. Um, that said, I do think the Virginia's governor's race uh, plays an outsized role in things because these are sort of uh, revealers of preferences or moods of the country. And I think that's the most important thing about these elections. Like, there's no reason an election for the Virginia governor should shape policy choices in Congress, except to the fact that members of Congress look at them as sort of uh, predictors or evidence of what's going to happen down the road. So they have a better grip on what they think their own fortunes are going to be. Um, they I also don't their think, priors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and so I think uh, I do think the election influenced uh, Democrats in the House to get going on this um, because they feared uh, that they will now even more certain that they'll lose the 2022 midterms and will not be able to do anything. Right. They won't have sort of their majority in the House. And second, I think they got worried that all of a sudden moderate members might start wavering on this and they might collapse the whole thing on them out of similar fears. Um, but at any rate, the action being taken in Congress, I think, was in part spurred by these elections, not because anyone's trying to influence what was going on in Virginia, uh, but because political actors are always watching everything that goes on and trying to understand what that means about the future. Uh, and that, yeah. that, that, to me, is what was going on there. No, and I think um, this might just be restating something um, Matt was getting at in a slightly different way. But I, when I think about sort of the role of things like the Virginia gubernatorial election and what people do in Congress, is it matters much less whether it actually matters and much more whether members believe that it matters and then adjust their behavior because they think that it matters, even if they're acting they're sort of empirically wrong about that. Um, and right. so I think that to the extent that we have evidence on kind of the relationship between, in, this holds true for votes in Congress, like to the extent that we have a relationship on individual votes mattering for folks' electoral outcomes, like it's very tenuous. Like you can find some examples, um, um, especially high profile things um, that kind of contribute to, um, to people's um, electoral fortunes. But that what really matters is that members believe that to be true and then they change their behavior based on that belief. So that's sort of what I when I think about like what happened in, and the um, in the Virginia. Debt the debt limit is like a yes. great example of all this, like the, the, the hair pulling and oh teeth gnashing and head scratching about the debt limit when the odds of sort of like whether the debt limit goes through reconciliation or gets passed by a supermajority in the Senate, like the odds of that influencing any election, like in any sort of even marginal way is really low. And it's also the same as like voting on a amendment to the Senate rules to structure an impeachment trial, which was supposed to be sort of like the beginning and end of Susan Collins's career, right? Like no one is sort of like <laughs> basing their vote on these sort of things that, um, go on in the internal workings of Congress, but members are very terrified that they do matter. Uh, and so that is what ultimately matters from a political point of view internally in the chamber. I, uh, I want to ask you all one, one last question before we finish up, which is sort of, um, I guess, a question as to, you know, what you've learned or maybe how you've changed your thinking about what you've seen these last few months or, or during the last year of the 117th Congress. Is there, is there any way in which sort of the way that things have unfolded has changed your understanding of how Congress operates, or at least how Congress is supposed to operate, and I'll I'll throw that to you, James, first. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've been a long critic of the kind of polarization thesis. Uh, I think it's way overstated, but I do think, and this is something that Molly and Matt have have spoken to. You know, we have these two parties. They don't really, you know, the irony is they don't really stand for much they don't really there's no like collection of preferences so, so it's like partisanship just for partisanship purposes which seems kind of odd to me but it is interesting to see the the, the power of these two parties divorced from anything divorced from like you know policy you know electoral considerations and everything else and if you go to something like say the covid pandemic uh, relief payments and you added something where you know bernie sanders wanted to plus up some money right you have Josh Hawley, who wants to plus up money for these direct payments. And you have Donald Trump. Look, in any world, if Donald Trump, the president of the United States, Bernie Sanders, the former presidential candidate and Democratic Socialist self-described member, and then Josh Hawley, a hardcore conservative, all agree on something, and that thing doesn't happen, that's like astonishing to me. Like, there's no reason why they ought not to have won. 
And, you know, I think it, it does speak to the power of parties and how they've kind of cemented our understanding of our politics. And it's, I, I don't know why though, because they don't agree on policy. If you name a policy, they all disagree on it. They don't agree on who should win. They don't agree on who should their candidates be. They don't agree on anything, but yet for some reason, they're, they are very powerful right now. And, and, I, and I can't quite explain that. And I think the last couple of uh, months have, have demonstrated that. And you're seeing that now with the progressives and how they're kind of losing ground vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, you know, I don't want to say moderates, it's falling in the same trap, but losing ground vis-a-vis -vis the kind of party establishment, the conventional thinking, whatever you want to call it. It, it really is astonishing. I would, I mean, I, I think that one thing that is sort of crystallized in my mind during the pandemic more than just the last year is how dangerous it is now that Congress's sort of dearth of oversight capacity is hurting it, uh, policy in the United States. And I think that the pandemic is a great example of how, you know, uh, execution of law on the executive branch side is really core towards good governance. Congress can only do so much by legislating and they need to be on top of how Donald Trump or Joe Biden is managing sort of pandemic funds, right? If you talk to the person on the street, well, if they don't like Trump, then Trump can't execute a thing. If they don't like Biden, he can't execute a thing. But the thing is that there are, you know, big differences in a president who is good at managing an executive branch to run programs and one who isn't. And it doesn't have to do with their partisanship. Uh, and now we have this enormous reconciliation bill coming through and maybe the Build Back Better Act. And you're going to throw the Department of Transportation, however many hundreds of billions of dollars. And the same thing is going to be true. Uh, passing a law is not solving a problem. Uh, and Congress really could use some help because, you know, the, the partisanship really undermines uh, oversight in every sense. But just the basic oversight of is DOT using this money wisely or in productive ways would really be useful right now. And uh, I'm afraid we are going to have continued sort of suboptimal uh, outcomes on that front. I agree with Matt. Um, and just to add something else that I has sort of crystallized for me over this year about the depths of the consequences of partisanship in, um, in Congress. And I am, unlike James, not a person who thinks that the polarization story is overblown. But even I did not expect that. Um, so no one expected what happened on January 6th, the Capitol to happen. But I did not expect sort of the response to that to be as partisan as it has. And I think that that, again, sort of the strength of the partisanship and what that has um, what that has meant for the institution's ability to respond um, and reform um, what uh, in response to um, to the the insurrection of the Capitol. Um, I think that has um, that just demonstrates a sort of additional level of the strength of the of partisanship that I um, I wasn't expecting. Well, great. Um, well, we are at time, so I want to uh, I want to thank the panelists for their insight today. I think it was a fantastic discussion, uh, a lot of good disagreement, which was very entertaining to watch as the moderator. And uh, I want to thank everyone who uh, who tuned in and uh, look forward to uh, to the next time we host one of these. And hopefully, you'll tune in then. So, uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs>